Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. When we transform Nebraska corn into ethanol, it doesn't disappear from the food supply. It just takes a little detour. Ethanol is made from the starch. The rest of the corn becomes livestock feed to create meat and dairy products, corn oil, sweetener, and other food ingredients, and maybe a little carbon dioxide to make your soft drinks fizzy. Homegrown ethanol helps satisfy America's hunger for energy and the world's appetite for feed and food. Nebraska's Family Corn Farmers, sustaining innovation. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, John Moret analyzes the sizes of crops in South America. John Hinners describes the value of U.S. pork exports. Tina Barrett outlines tax considerations, and Al Dutcher gives his weekly weather forecast. John Moret from J.E. Moret Grain Company is our corn and soybean market analyst this week. At its Ag Outlook Forum Thursday, the USDA said it believes U.S. farmers will plant 90 million acres of corn this spring, up from 88 million in 2015. The agency is projecting a small decrease of 200,000 acres in soybeans, leading to a total of 82.5 million. Wheat is set to take a sizable reduction. The USDA thinks farmers will scale back plantings nearly 7 percent from last year to 51 million acres. In late March, the USDA will firm up its estimates when it releases its prospective plantings report on the 31st. We discussed the acre breakdown when we talked with John Wednesday afternoon in Brunswick, Nebraska. We also talked about U.S. ethanol production, fund positions, and price movements in corn and soybean markets. We haven't moved at all. Corn's still kind of in that 350 to 375 futures range, and soybeans are stuck between the 860 to $9 range. We're stuck. What happens here? What moves this thing one way or the other? I think we got to have an event, and the event can be weather. We've talked about it. The event could be exports. We've talked about it in the past. We've just got to find something new, and today we can't find it. With as much grain as out there, do you think a delay in planting would cause that much of a rally? I think it'd give a little bit of a rally, Jeff, but it'd be very muted because all this pent-up selling is held up, and, and I think it'll come to the market rather quickly if we see the board price try to move up beyond this range. Let's talk about a few demand scenarios and start in exports. Now, is it a different story between corn and soybeans? Uh, I would say it is. I would say it is, but it's a different marketing uh, too. And what I mean by that is the soybeans are really an October to, to January or February product on the exports, and we're getting towards the end of February today. Once those are done, it's going to feel like we don't have any exports anymore. Corn, however, is very, very back end loaded, and so we're going to start loading about now. Uh, they'll pick up a little bit through the spring to meet the USDA numbers, and, and hopefully we're able to pick up a little additional. But it's the tale of two cities. You know, we've got the beans, those are done, it's over, and now we're going to have some corn hopefully kick out of the country. So The assumption would be that corn exports can pick up here. I would sure hope so, Jeff. The problem is that we need, to, we need to pick up just to see where the USDA is at and match that, and we've got a problem, another billion bushel behind that that we need to get rid of. So we need to not only start exporting more, but export beyond that to get rid of the surplus. So One of the other uh, consumers of corn would be ethanol. How high are ethanol stocks right now? You know, they're, they're near record high, Jeff, but we saw a report this morning, this is Wednesday, and, and we saw the stocks down a little bit and production up. That's a really, really good sign. And I think the trade was fearing that we'd see stocks up again and production down, meaning demand is less. But it's actually you know, going to be in a manageable level. I think the plants are going to be disciplined enough to scale back production to meet, meet the demand. Yeah, how much of a concern are higher ethanol stocks and lower oil prices? I think they're a big concern, but we're going to have to use so much of it anyway. There's a mandate. We're going to have to have 10% in all the gallons. I think ethanol is here to stay. I know that I've taken a lot of questions from farmers. They say, I heard the plant's going to close down. I don't think so. I don't think it's that kind of environment. Oil feels like it's bottoming, or at least within $30 of bottoming. So <laughs> hopefully, we can, hopefully we can stabilize, and I think the ethanol guy is going to be fine. Let's move down to South America. What do we know about harvest results from Brazil? It's excellent so far. 
Excellent. If you remember in the north when we talked, there was a dry spot. They picked up nearly perfect rains um, in the last 60 days. In fact, now the concern may be a little too wet for parts of the harvest up there, but they've got really, really good crops coming at them. And as they work south, Argentina is the same story. They were dry, pick up nearly perfect rains in the last two weeks, and now they're maybe a touch wet in Argentina. So I think what we're going to find in South America is really, really good crops all the way down. And on that same note, Jeff, we talk about what they're going to plant following the beans. It's corn. You know, their export tax on, on corn is now zero. You know, beans, I don't remember, it's either 25 or 35. 30 in but, but they're going to have a, a substantial increase in corn planting acres in, in Argentina. So we need to watch that here in the U.S. Is it a concern long term about how many acres Brazilians and Argentines are putting in? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then it's least cost production. So if they're able to produce it cheaper than we are, we're going to kind of put ourselves on a little bit of an island here, especially with corn, because I think the ethanol is going to keep our corn price propped up a little higher than the world market. So to go hit that next level will be a challenge for us. Last time we were on, we talked about fund positions. Update me on where they are. In, uh... Well, they've, they've covered some fund positions. You know, they were, they were record short in a lot of these a lot of these commodities and they've covered them, but they've covered them very very easily, I guess. It's, it hasn't been disruptive to the market. So, you know, we saw corn rally 15 cents and it did it about two weeks and then it fell right back down. So, you know, wheat's the same way. We rallied up 25 cents and we broke 10. So they're able to kind of uh, take the excess farmer inventory and offset that with their hedges when they need to get out of them. So has there been much grain moving? No, there really hasn't. Nobody wants to, Jeff. Uh, I think there's a lot of contracts being filled. You know, we see trucks active for existing sales, but additional sales are hard. I think you'll see the farmer fill existing contracts and try to think long and hard about what his plan is going forward. So how much help has basis provided? None. Basis <laughs> hasn't moved, Jeff. Bean basis hasn't moved. Corn basis hasn't moved. And the farmer is frustrated. I think that's a fair way to put it. Meaning what are the selling strategies right now? I think he needs to hope for what you talked about weather. I think he needs to uh, watch his cash flow and, and sell in front of it. I always tell guys, don't back yourself in a corner. So if you can see out in July or August and, and that price is 380 or 390 cash, you should sell it and walk away. What you don't want to do is wait until you have to have cash, drive to town and sell $3.20 corn. So. We also talked last time about planted acres. Do you have another impression about where the U.S. is going to be this year? I do, Jeff. I don't, there's not enough switches, in my opinion. I think you're going to see corn up 2 to 3 million acres and, and beans down about that much. And, and I think the corn switch needs to be bigger. If you look at the profitability, corn is much better than soybeans today. And we get, we're hearing from a lot of producers here anyway that are going to stay with our rotation. So I think the market needs to encourage some switches here. Next week, Mike Briggs will join us to look at cattle markets. Final U.S. pork export numbers for 2015 show total shipments were up about 2% from 2014. For the second year in a row, Mexico imported more pork than any other country. Japan finished a place behind, but the value per pound of its purchases was far above Mexico's. At the Nebraska Pork Producers Annual Meeting in Lincoln last week, we talked about foreign markets with John Hinners from the U.S. Meat Export Federation. We began by asking about the importance of pork trade to U.S. hog producers. Well, Jeff, when you look at the pork trade, it's, it's essential that we have meaningful access to the world's market for our products. When you look at uh, U.S. pork exports, uh, the value added to those hogs that we produce here in the United States and more importantly, the state of Nebraska, is nearly $50 for every market hog that we send, send to the market. Where are the big buyers at? Give me the big international customers. I'd say if you look at our, our top four markets as far as uh, volume, that would make up 76% of our volume. You would look at Mexico, uh, Japan, Korea, and then you would uh, consider Hong Kong, China as one region. So those, those four areas would make up about 76% of our market. So as you well know, we're constantly working to make sure that trade flows well into those markets and that U.S. has a, a good piece of their uh, uh, um, share of that, that, those markets. How do you feel pork exports closed out 2015 and are rolling here into 2016? Well, 2015 was an was a interesting year. Certainly when you look at um, a couple things that happened, we had the West Coast port slowdown. That, that slowed down our, our first quarter of, of 2015. You know, that, that certainly uh, didn't help matters at all. Uh, we, were, we were getting over some of the higher prices that we had saw uh, in 2014, 2015 due to the PEDV virus that hit, you know, in the United States. So our, our customers around the world were dealing with some increased prices. So we had some, uh, some of those challenges that we, we dealt with. But 
One thing that we try to do with uh, the U.S. pork is we never ever try to sell on price. We always try to market our product on the attributes of our U.S. Uh, safety systems with uh, you know that we have at the plant, uh, our, our products, uh, our our pork quality assurance programs that we have here in the United States. So and maybe some of our branded pork products. So prices maybe put off to the side a little bit if we can and we always try to market on the high quality attributes that we have. Does that mean it's more insulated to the rising and falling strength of the dollar? Well, the strength of the dollar certainly doesn't uh, help us in the export market when it, when it gets stronger, but uh, we try to insulate that by always talking about these other attributes so we can you know, reduce that barrier of those, those, that strength of the dollar, if so be. Uh, where are the big competitors for the U.S. coming from? When you look at competitors, uh, you know, around the world, uh, certainly um, we'd have to look at Europe. Uh, this past year, Europe, um, if you look at where their pork was going, they were going into Russia with about 400,000 metric tons of pork. All of a sudden, when the Russia market closed to um, uh, European pork, that European pork needed to find a new home. So a lot of that pork was going into Asia countries, uh, going into China, going into Japan, Korea as a frozen product. Uh, when that happened, uh, the United States, uh, the U.S. Meat Export Federation, uh, were, were realizing the trends. We went into uh, Japan with a little different strategy, constantly talking about our chilled pork uh, because we can get product, our product in chilled and never frozen as opposed to the Europeans uh, sending in frozen pork. So that was one of our strategies in the market to constantly talk about the chilled, the fresh pork that the U.S. has to offer. And I think we've seen uh, an uptick in that market based on that strategy. So we're constantly battling the Europeans. Um, let's not forget, you know, our trading partners, even with uh, uh, Canada and Mexico, they are in the world market too. So they do compete with us to some degree in, in some of these markets as well. Can you talk about Mexico and explain why they've risen to the top buyer of U.S. pork? Well, Mexico's been a terrific market for the United States pork industry. Uh, number one um, uh, volume market for U.S. We send a tremendous amount of our hams into the Mexico market. A lot of that product does go into further processing. I think about 65% of that product does go into further processing. So uh, we've seen a, a gradual increase in consumption. Uh, especially over the last four years with the Mexico consumer. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, you know, more interest in, in the uh, U.S. pork product uh, as a further processed product. And I think you know, some of the partnerships that we've forged with uh, importers and retailers, you know, actually going out and promoting our product. Um, pork in, in general has been a win-win for the consumers in Mexico. And, uh, nonetheless, um, you're going to see more and more pork being consumed. The trend looks good for uh, pork consumption in Mexico. Outside of the big buyers that we had talked about earlier, are there emerging countries that you're trying to target and uh, get more U.S. pork into? There are. There are countries, um, you know, we, we exported uh, Nebraska pork to over 105 different countries last year. But you got to remember, I talked about four of those countries taking up about 75 percent of the, the volume. So. You know, the other uh, 101 countries are going to make up that other 25%. I think South America, um, Central America, those countries are continuing to be good customers of U.S. A product. Uh, we're going to look into um, Africa, and we're, that's an emerging market. But uh, nonetheless, you always have to go and sell some of your products, some of your high-end products where people are willing to pay. So, um, you know, that's, those markets are Japan, Korea. You know, they have the money to, to buy some of our higher end products. And then, uh, of course, there are a variety of meats, some of the items that we don't consume here in the United States as much. Uh, there's always markets for some of those items, too, in some of the emerging markets. The price for pork across the U.S., meanwhile, is the cheapest in months. USDA data shows January's retail value averaged $3.79 per pound, the lowest mark since July. Some Nebraska crop growers may be receiving a mailed survey from Nebraska's National Agricultural Statistics Service, or NAS. Those responses on their intentions for spring planting will be used to provide the USDA's 2016 estimate at the end of March. Earlier this week, we talked with Nebraska NAS's director, Dean Grosskirth, to explain why it's valuable farmers accurately fill out and return the surveys. This is the March Agriculture Survey. Um, it is called our Perspective Planning Survey, and this will be the first producer-reported surveys that actually show what they're intending to plant 
for row crops this year. We randomly sample about 3,800 producers in Nebraska and we send out them a questionnaire to respond to the survey. Um, if they don't respond by mail, then we'll either call them up or personally visit them. All those numbers that will get collected and we will summarize them and put them all into a big data set. We will analyze them, look for outliers and things that we need to call back to verify and then we will um, set our estimates, um, send them into Washington DC about the middle of the month and Washington DC will compile the whole report and from all the states and put it out at the March 31st. I want to thank all the producers who fill out these reports. I mean, it is their voice, and the data is only as good as the number of responses we get, and these data are very important to farmers and ranchers throughout the state. So I encourage all of you to fill out your reports so we can have accurate numbers to make decisions on for a level playing field for all producers. The USDA's reports on grain stocks and prospective plantings are scheduled to be released Thursday, March 31st at 11 a.m. Central Time. The February Nebraska farmer says you might not know it now, but Del Fike wasn't always growing cover crops for grazing. Over the last 15 years, he's planted cereal rye and has added different species along the way. In the last three years, he's branched out into cocktail mixes to take soil health up a notch and cut back on his dependence on commercial inputs, all while extending the grazing season for cattle. In this month's issue, you can read about Fike, his partnership with Nate Belcher of Green Acres Cover Crops, and learn how cover crops and cattle complement one another to improve soil health. As we've told you previously, the USDA is projecting net cash and net farm income to fall in 2016, this time for the third year in a row. Net farm income is expected to be less than half the record farmers set in 2013 and off 3% from 2015. Earlier this week, we talked with Tina Barrett about tax changes farmers and ranchers should be aware of, and we began by talking about the current environment with lower incomes, but not necessarily lower tax bills. Well, you know, tax planning kind of is not what most people are thinking about right after March 1st, but um, it's certainly time to think about things and, and some of the bigger changes that are happening. But, but what we're seeing from a production standpoint is, is lower incomes, and, and what we're seeing from a tax planning standpoint is Maybe not yet, because there was so much income that was made between 2005 and 2012 that hasn't been paid tax on yet. Um, and so we've we got to keep that in mind that we're not ready to start lowering those tax bills dramatically uh, for most producers, um, because the only real way to do that without paying taxes is to lose a lot of money. So hopefully we're not seeing those negative incomes um, and that we're still needing to manage that, that tax bill. Overall, though, you do believe incomes in 2016 <coughs> will be lower? It sure, well, you know, lower compared to three or four years yeah. ago. You know, will it be similar to 15 maybe? Um, you know, I think we got a lot to see. You know, 15 we ended up with excellent yields. So, you know, if we do end up with average yields, 16 will be a little bit less. Um, you know, we don't know for sure what pricing opportunities we have. Um, and it looks like, you know, the ARC payment is going to be about the same. So, uh, you know, at this point we're kind of planning 15 or 16 to be about but what 15 was, but um, certainly nothing like what we had experienced five years ago. Let's talk about some uh, specific things within taxes, uh, starting with section 179. Now there have been some changes, where are we? Yeah, so finally, finally we can plan on this. Um, so for several years we've been waiting for an extender bill in December to get us, you know, what we wanted to hear. So last December they gave us permanent 179 at 500,000 of expense election, again, the purchase limit. So if you spend more than two million, you start to lose that. But for most producers, that fits. Um, we have that permanent and it's indexed for inflation in $10,000 increments. So it'll probably take a few years before we see that $500,000 change, but it, it will change over time for us. But there's a bonus change as well? Right, so we got permanent 179 and the bonus depreciation, which um, both allow us to write off assets in the first year of purchase, but in different ways that bonus they decided to go ahead and phase down um, and so we have 50 percent bonus again for 16 and 17, 40 percent for 18, 30 percent for 19 and then gone. Um, for most producers that 179 is enough and we're going to be good there. The, the big difference between the two is both bonus we can write off part of that machine shed, those um, ag buildings. Um, so for anybody who's thinking about putting up one of those buildings probably the next couple of years from a tax standpoint uh, is the time to do it. Uh, it might not be the right time from a management standpoint though. Uh, what's the deadline change to remember for next year? Okay, so they uh, early in 15 they made some changes to the filing deadlines for the 2016 tax return. So this is what we're going to be filing a year mm -hmm. from now. 
um, and then move the corporate tax deadlines for the C corporations from March 15th to April 15th, and move the partnership deadlines from April 15th to March 15th. All in, you know, wanted to get those flow through inter entities due and done before we needed to file the individual return. So a good change, but it is gonna be different, um, certainly going to affect the way your tax office <laughs> works and the, tax, the workflow that, that we experience. Um, so they just might be wanting some information at a different time. You said for C, this is a small portion of people you said it might affect, but for C Corp and S Corps, there's also uh, something to keep in mind. Right, so um, there's a, uh, when you switch from a C Corp to an S Corp, there's a holding period and it's been 10 years. And probably for the last 10 years, they said sometimes, um, well, if you did it seven years ago, you're good. And if you did it five years ago, you're good. And we've never been able to plan that. And uh, in December with that tax extender bill, they gave us a five year permanent um, limit there. So, so for those corporations that have that land sitting in it that we're trying to get out um, when switching over to S Corps, you've got a five year holding period. And um, if, you, if you're involved in that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you don't, then that's okay. You can just ignore that. <laughs> okay, can do, Tina. Uh, supplies under $2,500 written off without question. Tell me what it means. Right, so in November, a couple of years ago, they gave us new repair regs, which seems funny to me because it doesn't affect repairs, it affects supplies. Um, but they said $500, which we kind of looked at and went, 500 nothing on the farm is bought for less than $500, just forget it. Um, in November, they said, okay, that was silly. Let's make it 2500 um, so any supply that you purchase up to $2,500, we can write off as a supply, don't need to capitalize that item. So we're probably talking about things like welders and generators and those smaller items that we're always, do we capitalize or not? Um, but a couple cautions there that we're seeing as we, as we start to get into this, um, we need to establish a business practice for wherever up to $2,500 that you want to, to do, but anything item that you buy then that's under that limit becomes a supply. So one of the first ones we thought of that this could cause a problem for is cow-calf producers who are buying heifers that their per item um, limit is usually under 25 or back under 2,500 now. Um, and so uh, that would mean we could call all of those cows supplies. Um, I'm not sure that's the right choice when we're talking about, um, especially when we're buying uh, cows and borrowing money for them and making payments later. It also means that when you sell those items, we have ordinary income uh -huh. to recognize. And that's not the tra tax treatment that we get from cows right now. And so um, there's some long-term solutions. So you do really wanna make sure that before your tax repair is just mindlessly electing this um, de minimis repair uh, reg that we take into effect. And you can choose a thousand dollar limit for your operation if you want to. Um, and so anywhere in there. So something certainly to talk about with your tax repair and what's right for you. Uh, we also did just get word from the state of Nebraska that they're going to follow that. So that generator that would have been a personal property tax item, um, and then now we're going to call a supply, doesn't need to be on your personal property tax return either. So. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension Associate State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we again for the weekly forecast. During this last week, the majority of the storm activity across the nation was associated with a very strong upper air low that moved across the southern plains and then moved northeastward such that we brought some significant snowfall to portions of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, and, and to the east of that, unfortunately, we had some significant severe weather, particularly as you got down into extreme southeastern United States, Georgia, North Carolina. We had a couple deaths due to tornadic activity. And as we move through this next week, we are paying attention to a series of storms that are expected to roll across the country. And one of them may actually bring some significant impacts to Nebraska, depending on whether or not it falls within the path that the GFS model is indicating or if it does a European model forecast, which is to take it just south of the region. So let's take a look at, see how this may play out. Here's the first wave that is expected to move through the state, but before this reaches us here tomorrow, we are expecting a very nice day today as we have short-term ridging in place, so we should all be well into the 60 degree range across the state. And then the system will rapidly move eastward through the overnight hours and bring us a slight cool down. Now, because it's moving so rapidly, there's just not a lot of moisture associated with it. So I think at best we might see a few sprinkles with the likeliest area of precipitation hitting the surface would be the panhandle. Now, as we go into tomorrow, we see that system rapidly moving across the Great Lakes and we get a slight 
slight northwest slow on the back side of this. So we'll drop our temperatures down about 5 to 10 degrees depending on location. But we'll still be looking at a fairly nice day, although a bit windy. Now as we get into Monday, we start to see another system coming into the western United States and rapidly moving into the central Rockies. And this one does have the ability, according to the models, to really generate a fairly significant little low pressure system. And right now we're using the GFS model. That takes the basic, the prime portion of the energy across uh, northern Kansas and southeastern and south central Nebraska. But if we look at the ECM model, it takes a little bit farther deeper. So if we look at the Tuesday forecast, you can see the system gets tightly wound up. We get a fairly good fetch of cold air on the back side of it. So any precipitation that does change over to snow is going to be very wet and heavy. And the most likely area for significant accumulation at this time will be painted across north central northeastern Kansas. But a little bit farther drift to north and a verification of the GFS model, and we would see that snow rapidly evolving as we get into Nebraska, particularly east central southeast and south central Nebraska. And then as we get into Wednesday, we see the system rapidly move toward the upper Great Lakes region and we're in a northwest flow. So a couple series of storms will move to the southeast. No moisture associated, them, just a little bit of flurry activity, but nothing in the way of real bitter cold weather. And then we see the high pressure ridge on Thursday building back up. So we'll see a rebound in temperatures and it'll really depend on our daily highs, what we have for snow cover on the ground if we do get any with the storm system early next week. And as we go into Friday, that system out of the Pacific Northwest rapidly moves over to Nebraska and gives us another chance of light precipitation. And if we look even farther down the road, there's several in a line of storms that are posed to move into the Western United States, so it appears that we're going to enter the month of March with very stormy weather. Now the 8 to 14 day forecast keeps the above normal trend to the western portion of the United States, below normal of course over the Ohio River Valley, and in terms of precipitation, we see this overall dry pattern, but this severely has missed the storm system, and I expect that if we're going to see drier than normal conditions, it'll be painted across the Dakotas and points to the west, and more above normal moisture from Nebraska and points to the southwest. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews can be found individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on corn and soybean markets, pork exports, and tax considerations. As always, you can keep track of Market Journal during the week by following us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Next week, Mike Briggs will be our market analyst and we'll look at harvest progress in South America with DTN's Alistair Stewart. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.